Hey, Gateway! Hey, Gateway! Hey, Gateway! Hey, Gateway! Hey, Gateway! Can't wait to see your beautiful faces again soon. Bye! Bye! Kia ora Gateway and welcome to Church Online. I'm Matt Perry, part of the leadership team here. And we're so glad that you could join us this morning. We hope you and everyone in your bubble is keeping safe and well. Here's a quick rundown of this morning's gathering. Uh, first, we have some updates to bring to you. And then we'll have a time of worship followed by Don, who will bring us the first message in our brand new series. After that, we'll head back to another time of worship with the benediction to close. So first, as you are probably well aware, the government has introduced mandatory sign-in at all levels for busy places and large gatherings to ensure that contact tracing can take place quickly in the event of a community outbreak. So for Gateway, this means we need to ensure everyone keeps a record of when they visit our building for any reason, either by scanning the QR codes with the COVID-19 Tracer app or by making a manual record. And we're currently working on what this will look like for us practically and how we can make our processes as simple as possible. We'll keep you fully up to date as this rolls out, but for now, we just wanted to give you a heads up that there will be some new systems in place when we gather together again in person. And finally, tonight at 6.30, Sunday Night Church is hosting another prayer meeting. And this is open to everyone to attend. We'd love for you to join us. And information on how to register can be found on our website at Online Church on the Online Church tab. And of course, it's Father's Day today. So happy Father's Day. Whatever state of fatherhood or parenthood you're in, we pray the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, on you. That's it from me, and as we head into a time of worship, remember that even though we aren't in the building together, we are believing that the Holy Spirit will be tangible and present in every heart and home this morning as we gather throughout the city and the nation. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes so bless the Lord oh my soul Worship His 
stop working even when I don't see it you're working 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Great to be with you again. Um, so sorry it's not in person, but uh, this is the very next best thing. Over the next couple of weeks, I want to tackle a subject. We're not going to cover all of it by any means, but just looking at the question, can the scriptures be trusted? Over the past few years, I've been deeply disturbed by the number of people, including well-known celebrities, and not a few. Not, there's been a few from even our own faith community who have come out and publicly announced that they've deconverted. Deconversion is the fashionable and euphemistic term for what the ancients called apostasy, the betrayal of one's baptismal vows. More recently, in colloquial language, we've called it backsliding. Having read a number of these deconversion stories, I've noticed a common thread in the journeys is a loss of faith in the scriptures. At some point in time, these people have engaged with enlightened writers who raised serious questions about the Bible's reliability and trustworthiness. And these folk had simply no answers for these deep questions. Doubts festered into unbelief and abandonment of faith followed with a coming out announcement of their deconversion. I'm sure most of you will have heard of a group of what we call new atheists, uh, men by the name of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett. They have, of course, over the years been very, very vocal in their ridicule of the Bible. Sam Harris stated, The Bible, it seems certain, was the work of sand-strewn men and women who thought the earth was flat and for whom the wheelbarrow would have been a breathtaking example of emerging technology. Christopher Hitchens raised, raged that the Bible indeed does contain a warrant for trafficking in humans, for ethnic cleansing, for slavery, for bride price, for indiscriminate massacre. It was put together by crude, uncultured mammals. For all the headlines that such men have grabbed and for all of the din that they have produced, their criticism of the Bible might be termed uh, criticism light. They are criticisms from men who, seriously, you wonder if they've ever even read the Bible, and if they have, they've definitely not read it seriously. And even well-known atheists have distanced themselves from their comments with a degree of embarrassment. Richard Dawkins even initially claimed that there was no historical evidence for the person of Jesus outside the New Testament. He has since gone back on that claim as he should. He obviously might be a very uh, famous biologist, but he's clearly not a historian. The criticisms of uh, such men can be relatively easily dismissed, but there, to be truthful, is another genre of scholars whose challenges to the Bible's trustworthiness are not so easily set aside. Take a man by the name of Bart Ehrman, for example. He's a bona fide New Testament scholar and textual critic. He's the author of over 30 books, six of which have been New York Times bestsellers. Ehrman, who formerly was an evangelical Christian, lost his faith and has become an atheist agnostic, uh, atheist slash agnostic. His book, Misquoting Jesus, has been influential in many people losing their trust and reliability in the scriptures. His conclusion regarding the Bible was, at the end of the day, the Bible is a very human book. 
what I, what I hope to do over the next couple of weeks is at least look at something of what Ehrman has raised in terms of question. As I said before, we're not going to be able to cover it all by any means, but I would like to uh, at least start in seeking to provide something of an apologetic of sorts for the reliability and trustworthiness of the scripture. I, I want to look, uh, as, as we look at the scriptures, um, in this way, it, it is something of a problem for me. Uh, let me explain why, if I can. C.S. Lewis wrote a brilliant little essay called Meditation in a Tool Shed, and it opens like this. He says, I was standing today in a dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside, and through the crack at the top of the door, there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing things by it. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my face. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw the tool shed and uh, above all, uh, I, sorry, I saw no tool shed and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside, and beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and at the beam are very different experiences. Now, I think Lewis's insight is particularly applicable in terms of what I'm trying to do in these series of messages. It's so possible to be taken up with looking at the scriptures that we fail to look along them. So looking at the scriptures is a bit like looking at the beam of the sunlight. And in doing that, we fail to look along the scriptures to the one they point to. Perhaps changing the analogy, we could look along or through a telescope so that we can see the starry heavens. The telescope is meant to be looked along or through not at. When you look at, at the telescope, you may well have missed the whole point of the exercise. Now, looking at the telescope might be needed if there are adjustments that are required, but if we never look along it or through it, then we've missed the whole point and its existence has been lost to us. Like the telescope, the Bible is meant to be an end, uh, oh, sorry, a means to an end and not the end itself. Scriptures don't exist to provide information to be analysed, scrutinised or critiqued. They, they exist to introduce us to a person, a person that's meant to be encountered. The Bible is not primarily about information that needs to be absorbed, but a personality that needs to be known and steeped in. Having said that, we are going to do a couple of messages that are looking at the Bible. But we must remember that looking at the Bible is never the end goal. If you need to adjust the telescope, you do so, but don't fail to look along it to see all that it can and will disclose. So with that caveat, let's look at the Bible. For over 2,000 years, Christians have been guided in their faith and their practice by the teachings of Holy Scripture. In its pages, we believe that we get to understand who God is and what he requires of us. The Westminster Confession of 1646 says the scripture gives us the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, for man's salvation, faith and life. When we claim, as we do, that the Bible is divinely inspired, we are claiming that it has its ultimate source in God. Not merely that it's a human book inspired in the same way that we might say Shakespeare is inspired. We're claiming that it is a written record from God. It is divinely authoritative so that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. The Bible makes this claim for itself, most clearly in passages like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in and unto all good works. The word inspiration there literally means it's God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. 2, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, God's, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The word carried along is the idea of being borne along as a sailing ship would be borne along by the wind. 
Now, when we talk about the scripture being inspired and men being borne along by the spirit, it doesn't mean that God mechanically dictated the words to these human puppet authors, something like the occult equivalent of automatic writing. We believe that God providentially prepared human writers through their upbringing, through their education, through their life experiences, so that when they wrote the scripture, it was their own words, their own style, yet God inspired them and breathed on them so that what they, what, what they wrote really was from God. Theolog theologians call that concursive inspiration. Perhaps a very uh, poor analogy might be something like the incarnation of Christ, where we know Jesus was truly God and truly man. In some respect, though lesser than, the scriptures are truly God's word, truly God and yet truly man. God doesn't reject the human personalities of the people who wrote the scriptures. He rather clothed himself, himself with their humanity. He uses Luke's uh, understanding and knowledge of medicine and love of history, and he weaves them together into the sacred text. Matthew, the tax collector, uh, was a tax collector. You, you read, as you read his gospel, it's easy to see his gifts and his form of vocation shining through. While Mark and Luke and John all reference money in their gospel, they speak of mites and pennies and farthings, Matthew, in addition to those terms, uses terms like Talents, pounds, gold, silver, brass, tribute. He uses the terminology that reveals a profound familiarity with the world of finances, with debts, and with money changes. The Holy Spirit carrying him along didn't cancel out his humanity. Rather, he expressed himself through it. Now, I'm very aware that a critic would obviously reject the Bible's testimony of its own divine inspiration as an example of circular reasoning. So they would say, well, the Bible is God's word because the Bible says so. That simply doesn't wash. What is uh, outside evidence to suggest that the Bible's claims for itself are in fact true? It's a, it's a valid question. As I said, to answer adequately would take much more time than we have available to us. But I will make a start and perhaps we can come back to it in the future. What I would first want to say is that the Bible is absolutely unique among books, among literature. It stands alone. Now, again, my skeptic friend might be spluttering through this talk, and I know that he'll interrupt me to uh, express his frustra frustrations and say unique is different from divinely inspired. But let me concentrate for a moment on the idea of unique. Webster's Dictionary defines unique as one and only, single, different from all others, having no alike or equal. And I think I can say without fear of contradiction that the Bible is absolutely unique. Now we know that the Bible is a grand narrative, it's an overarching story, but it is a story that is a story like no other, that it has no equal. The Bible is absolutely unique in its formation. It was written over a span of 1400 years on three continents, Africa, Asia and Europe. It was written by a heterogeneous number of people belonging to diverse walks of life, including kings, herdsmen, soldiers, fishermen, priests, prophets, tent makers, and physicians. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written in different genres, including poetry, history, personal correspondence, and as apocalyptic literature. Its subject matter contains hundreds of controversial subjects, and yet its authors speak with a harmony and agreement that is astounding. You imagine just taking 10 authors from our modern era, not 40, take them from just one walk of life, one generation, one geographical area, and one language, and give them one controversial subject and try and get them to speak on harmony and unity. Um, I, I would wish you the best of luck on that one. The Bible, secondly, is absolutely unique in its circulation. The Bible has been read by more people and has been published in more languages than any other book in history. The Guinness Book of Records records it as the best-selling book of all time with over 5 billion copies sold and distributed. At one point in their history, the British, 
and Foreign Bible Society claimed that in order to meet, to meet the demands of the Bible, they needed to produce a Bible every second, day and night, 24-7. Now, I know my skeptic friend would say, all of what you've just said might be true, but it doesn't prove it's God's word. And of course, he's right. But it does prove it's unique. And at this point in time, that's all I'm saying. The Bible is absolutely unique in its translation. As of 2020, the Bible had been fully translated into 704 languages. That's 5.7 billion people who have the Bible in their own native tongue. The New Testament has been translated into an additional 1,551 languages and Bible portions or stories into another 1,160 languages. Now, there are 6,909 recognized languages in the world, so that leaves about 1,100 languages for the Bible yet to be translated into so that people can have it in its native tongue. That's about 167 million people. Translators believe that they'll have that task done by, at the latest, 2038, but more probably in 2025. Fascinating, you, you compare those figures with the translation, for example, of the Quran, the Quran. It's available in 47 languages. Of course, there's no hurry to publish the Quran in other languages because Muslims believe that God's word can really only be understood and read in Arabic. The Bible is unique in its survival through intense persecution and criticism. The Bible has withstood vicious attacks from people opposed to it like no other books have. From the Roman Caesars to the communist dictators, innumerable regimes throughout history have set themselves to rid their country and their people of the scriptures. Somebody has quit, they might as well have put their shoulder to the burning wheel of the sun and tried to stop it in its flaming course as an attempt to destroy the Bible. To slightly alter a very funny G.K. Chesterton quote, on numerous occasions it looked like the Bible had gone to the dogs. In each case it was the dog that died. No other book has been chopped, knifed, sifted, scrutinized, analyzed and vilified with such venom and skepticism as the Bible. And yet it remains loved, read and studied by millions. The French skeptic Voltaire, who died in 1778, predicted that the Bible and Christianity would be swept from existence within a hundred years of his death. Fifty years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society were using Voltaire's old printing press in his former home to produce and store Bibles. I suspect that God really does have a sense of humour. Now again, a skeptic might say, and I agree, that none of that proves that it's God's word. My point is simply that the Bible is absolutely unique. The Bible is unique in its impact on Western civilization. It has been unquestionably the central foundational influence on Western culture. Its stories, its images, its conceptual patterns, its turns of phrases permeate Western culture from top to bottom. There's not one aspect of Western civilization that its impact cannot be detected in, from law to politics, from art to music, from economics to education. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you imagine how bereft Western civilization would be without the Bible's influence, for example, in English literature. There would be no John Milton's Paradise Lost. There would be no Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. There would be very little Shakespeare, no John Steinbeck's East of Eden, no Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, no J.R. Tolkien with The Lord of the Rings, no Chronicles of Narnia, no Brothers Karazimov by Dostoevsky, and no Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, no Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. And that is just a small sample of what we would have lost without the Bible's influence. Music would be absolutely impoverished, no bark. No Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Liszt or Mendelssohn. No Bob Dylan. Although, mind you, Karen might want to suggest that it wouldn't actually be a bad thing. But no Bono, no you too. Imagine the art world without the influence of the Bible. No Da Vinci's Last Supper. No Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Son. No Michelangelo's Creation of Adam. No Raphael's Transfiguration. No Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. Now, my skeptic friend is saying, stop it. 
I can see that the Bible has influenced in, in Western society and, and maybe it is even unique. But none of what you have said proves that the Bible is what you claim it to be, God's word. True, but I would want to say it's unique. And given what we've considered to this point, you might want to ask, why is it so remarkable? Why is it such one-of-a-kind book? Skeptics have gone on to say it's full of mistakes and contradictions and it should not be trusted. And what I'd like to do next week is start to look briefly at some of those claims and see if there's not an answer to them so that we can retain our, tr our sense of trust in, in the fact that the Bible it remains reliable and, and is in fact God's word. In a 
hard to understand And a hard to understand And a hard to understand To know you To know you As we close, please raise your hands and allow me the privilege of speaking the blessing of number six over you and your families. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. May the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you always until he comes again. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again tonight at our prayer meeting at 6.30. Ka kite anu.